Hello everyone, uh, I see some familiar faces. For those who don't know me, uh, my name is Marek Oswald. I'm a senior software engineer here at Kiwi.com uh, in the Ancillaries Mobile Tribe. And today uh, I'm, gonna wor I'm gonna tell you something about clean architecture and uh, how can we use it for Android. Um, so, uh, as a sort of, you know, to kick this off, uh, there's a quote from Robert C. Martin, author of this book. Uh, clean architecture and uh, he basically says that every system provides two different values for stakeholders there's the behavior and there's the structure behavior is basically what makes money or saves money that's the reason of being of every computer system but there's also structure which is how uh, easy it is to modify the system how resilient it is to the changes and so on and so forth our goal as software engineers is to keep both of these values high uh, oftentimes uh, there's a lot of push for behavior uh, product managers or customer are requesting new features, often at the detriment of the structure, which is the so-called architecture. And uh, today's lecture is, is about uh, how we can keep both of these values high, as I mentioned. Um, there's another quote from the author uh, that our goal is basically to minimize the human resources required to build and maintain the system. It's just kind of weird because it's sort of like if our job were to put ourselves out of a job, but in, in real life situations, there's usually way more requirements for changes and, and way more priorities than uh, we can, we can uh, assign developers to. So this is more about uh, spend times on useful things and not spend times on refactoring endlessly. So what is a clean architecture? Clean architecture, uh, usually if you Google it, you see this kind of um, a dart-like uh, picture or dart target-like picture. Um, a, it was coined by Robert C. Martin, also known as Uncle Bob, which is the nickname he uses with, uh, within his blog posts and some other events. And um, uh, then later it was published as a book in 2017. Uh, and I'm gonna briefly go through some of the most important concepts and then in the second part of the presentation, I'm gonna talk about Android specifically. So first of all, some terminology, because it might be a little confusing. Um, clean architecture defines module as the smallest unit of development. Um, you can think of it sort of like a Java class. Kotlin made things a little more complicated with top-level uh, references and top-level variables. But uh, if you sort of think of it that everything compiles into JVM and everything in JVM has to be a class, I'm going to use the term class instead of module. The other term is component. Components are roughly um, um, equivalent to gradual modules. It's a bunch of code that's compiled together that serves a similar purpose. So throughout the rest of this talk, I'm going to use the terms uh, uh, class and component. It's a bit of a column A and column B because these terms are unique and so we don't mix up modules with components. Um, we can split um, any kind of architecture or any kind of like the way we structure code into two, um, two terms. There's policy and there's details. Policy is the reason of being. That's the, that's the behavior that I mentioned in my first slide. And details is everything else that doesn't serve the purpose, maybe the delivery mechanism of the policy. So for example, UI is a detail, uh, database is a detail, network communication is a detail because it may be swapped and still the reason of existence of each system can still be the same. Now, here's a, here's a time for the first truth bomb of the talk. Android is a detail, which uh, might sound a little confusing because lots of us as Android in, in our job titles, like usually if you ask for the job, they were asking you a bunch of Android questions. But for the purposes of clean architecture, we're going to treat Android as a detail. All right, so there are these solid principles, which are the core tenant of the clean architecture. They relate to the classes. Originally, they were um, supposedly uh, uh, aligned or ordered a little differently, but then somebody had the great idea to order them like so. So they would spell solid so everybody could remember it, actually. The first one is a single responsibility principle. It's a corollary to something called Conway's Law. Conway's Law basically says that the code is structured along the lines how the company structures their communication lines. So what does it mean? If you have a punk startup that doesn't really have any communication uh, structure, everybody just does whatever they want, they're like, you're just shipping features left and right, uh, the architecture is going to look the same which means no communication structure, no architecture. Uh, as opposed, here in Kiwi, we have our engineering divided into five tribes. And if you would look at our code base, uh, would restructure the packages and draw four lines, you could, you could clearly see the differences, like which tribe is handling which part of the code. So 
you can kind of you can kind of assume the architecture from there. But uh, single responsibility principle is often misquoted as a class should do one thing and should do one thing well. That's not true. The single responsibility principle says that uh, each each class should have one stakeholder. So, for example, if you're defining a UI, probably your UX designer is your stakeholder. If if they decide to they want to change something, color of a button or some label or something, that's the reason for change of the class. Another stakeholder might be some kind of business development or product manager. Something is changing, right? For example, we're not charging 10% markup anymore. We're charging 15% markup. So. In that case, if you have a class that have two reasons for change, right? So for example, the UI has changed because of UX designer requested some change or because of the business logic, it breaks the single responsibility principle. There should be one reason for the class to change or one stakeholder that initiates the, class, uh, the, the change. The open cost uh, principle is kind of old one. It was uh, coined by Bertrand Meyer in the 80s. And it says uh, that the you know, we should be able to modify a system behavior by introducing new code instead of uh, changing the existing code. In uh, changing of existing code is usually using some dirty tricks, such as reflection or function pointers. So uh, we should be able to extend the behavior of the system by writing new code rather than uh, uh, hacking the old code. The Liskov substitution principle uh, coined by Barbara Liskov in 1988 is pretty much a given in object-oriented languages. And it says that you can build the software out of substitutable parts. So um, in our case, it's mostly like dependent interfaces, and then you can then you can swap the real implementation, probably using dependency injection or use abstract classes, and then the concrete implementation can can modify the behavior, uh, which was not given in let's say languages like C. So it's not really that much of a value now in OOP. The interface segregation principle is is uh, another. Pretty much no one. Um, if you have a fat bloating interface that provides 25 methods, you should probably split it. We know it very well from Java. For example, HashSet is implementing iterable, comparable, enumerable, that kind of stuff. So uh, in case you have you know, lots of methods in your, in your interface, probably should be split into multiple ones. And then your real implementation can, can implement all of these ones. But you can. You can uh, you can uh, supply to your callers uh, just a part of the API that they actually use. The dependency inversion principle is a little tricky because you have to imagine, right? Imagine a program written in C. It starts in the main function, and then the main function calls the underlying function. That's the direction of control. So the main function calls subfunction one, subfunction one calls subfunction two, and so on and so forth. Whereas the dependency should go inversely against the control. Um, so if you, sort of, if you sort of think about it, the component that holds the main component uh, should depend on the lower levels and not the vice versa. Like your lower level components should not uh, um, depend on the higher level components. All right, so now we know the solid principles. What do we actually do? Uh, our job, if we want to build the structure in order to keep the value of the structure high, we uh, split the code into a hierarchy of components. We split them into higher level components and lower level components. The higher level components consist of the policy. The lower level components mostly con consist of the details, like I've mentioned in previous slides. Um, there are some component coupling principles. I'm going to go very briefly around them. Uh, acyclic dependencies says allow no cycles in the uh, component dependencies graph. This one is easy. Gradle doesn't allow that, so that one is a freebie. Uh, there's a stable dependencies principle. Depending on the direction of stability, what is the stability? Uh, it's this equation. Uh, the fan out is the number of uh, components that uh, uh, you depend on. And the fan in is the number of components that depend on your component. So for example, if you have a, mo if you have a Gradle module, that doesn't depend on any dependencies. It's super stable because all the other modules depend on it. Uh, the other example is going to be uh, the dirty main, which is 100% unstable. But I'm going to talk about it later. And there's the third one, which is stable abstractions principle. You can also calculate the abstractness. This equation is a little simpler. It's just the number of abstract classes and interfaces divided by the total number of classes. So then you can measure the abstractness. And the rule says that once you calculate these two numbers, the instability and abstractness, then they should be pretty much uh, the same, given some kind of range. 
if, if, there, if they start to differ a lot, it's probably a time to uh, refactor a component into something else because you're putting way much logic into something that probably should be split. All right. Um, so what is a good architecture? A good architecture is independent. And it's independent of the following things. It's independent of frameworks. This one is a little tricky. I'm going to mention it a little further along the way. Uh, but if you really build a good architecture, you really shouldn't, um, you really shouldn't uh, rely on one concrete framework, uh, which would make porting the application uh, really difficult. Uh, it should be testable. This is, a, this is pretty much a given in a host target environment, such as mobile apps development, where the host is the machine that you write the code on, and the target is the machine, usually a phone or tablet or a TV or a smartwatch or whatever that runs the code. And uh, testable in the sense that you don't need any kind of special device or any kind of appendix uh, to run the test. So no emulator, no simulator, nothing of the sorts. Uh, this would also mean that the tests are easily runnable on CI or on the pipelines. It's independent of the UI. UI is a detail, as I've mentioned. So um, as a sort of um, exercise that we did recently in Kiwi, we switched all of our UI pretty much from the view framework into Compose. If it's going easy, you know that your architecture is, is clean. If it's going pretty hard, then you might have some issues there, right? Probably uh, uh, a further refactoring is, is needed. Independent of the database, that's not really the case for Android. You don't really have that much of a choice of a database, but you can sort of think of it as, all right, uh, if you use uh, Room or Realm for persistence, that's a detail, and you sh it shouldn't be hard-coded into your business logic where you provide the policy or, or what's the reason of the application directly into your business cases. And independent of any external agency, this one is kind of weird, but if your app has hard-coded values, like it's only re releasable every, let's say, 4th of May, uh, then it's probably hard. Um, if, if, um, if, for example, there's only one person who can actually understand this pile of code and nobody else can maintain it, then it's probably not a clean architecture either. Um, well, to quote today's theme, only a Sith deals in absolutes. Uh, there is a, there is exemption to the rule, which is the so-called dirty main. Um, dirty as opposed to clean. It's nothing um, innuendo-like. And the main is called after the C, uh, C family of languages, so it refers to the main function that runs the, runs the entire uh, program. So uh, in Android, this should probably call the dirty app, as in the module that your Android Studio creates for you when you start a new project. So this is where all the gunk that you need to glue the app together actually comes by. So this is your uh, dependency injection framework initialization, application initialization, dependencies management, Gradle scripts, that kind of stuff. So that, that's the dirty main. It should be kept as small as possible. And probably if you're, if you're doing business changes into your app, you shouldn't touch it. All right. So that's the first part of the talk. What about Android? Um, so I got this very amazing quote, also from Clean Architecture book by uh, James Grenning. And it says, oh, well, when we tie up our, our uh, application code into the Android API directly, we're essentially writing firmware because it's impossible to get the code out of the Android or uh, out of the Android family of devices, sort of, which could be the case. All right. Uh, this one is an oldie, but I had to, I had to uh, sort of put it in there. I started self-teaching myself Android in 2011. I got a summer job and I bought my first device, which was HTC Incredible S. Wonderful device, still have it, although it doesn't connect to the internet anymore. Uh, and uh, I got myself the literature, which was this wonderful book printed in 2009. Um, and it was a second printing, so it also covered the latest uh, coolness, which was Android API 1.5. And after I blasted through the lessons of how to make a, a text view and buttons and so on and so forth, all right, let's get to the dirty stuff, which is let's download something from the internet and present it in the app. And the example looks something like this. And like um, when I did the dry run, I asked the question, what's wrong with this picture? And um, our, let's say, most uh, skilled team leads at everything. And you could see the little flashbacks of uh, maintaining terrible code. But uh, aside the inner async task, which is going to crash the app if you do uh, rotation or if you launch another uh, activity and you, you have don't keep activities on, um, 
who is the stakeholder of, the, of this class, really? Uh, what does it actually do? Well, it's an activity. It definitely does UI, right? It binds the data into the UI. That's the on post execute stuff. Um, it does uh, data retrieval, connects to the internet probably or whatever, uh, takes the data from the database, probably parses it because whatever it gets is probably unusable, um, which is another case. And then uh, probably does some logic. So there's also business logic all tied up to this async task, um, which, mean, which means like everybody who's a stakeholder of the app is stakeholder of this class. This class does everything. This is where we started from, and it wasn't, it wasn't very unusual to see this kind of uh, example to, to get quickly up and running in, in books like these, or even in stuff like Stack Overflow, uh, developers.enter.com. So this is where we came from. Uh, Godlike classes, everything in single class, everything everywhere all at once. Um, yeah, here's another quote from Robert C. Martin. This is probably because you know, you, your excitement uh, uh, vastly overfills your skills. You know, and uh, basically, like trying to figure out how to build a, the the right architecture is at this point uh, thought of as an impediment. So uh, you just don't do it. The problem is like when you know when the platform was fairly young, lots of people who didn't know any better, including me, were hired, and I did some some of the less terrible code than that, but I started there. So. <laughs> What was the thing uh, with Android and architecture? There wasn't any. There wasn't any pattern that was first like pushed. In fact, Android, when it started, it kind of had uh, the opposite problem because there were limit on class numbers. There were li limit of method numbers. So if you really wanted to do something very complicated, you kind of couldn't. So um, getting, the, getting your, getting your uh, code a little dirty was well, at least passively encouraged. Um, Ender did some patterns later on. For example, list view was uh, replaced by recycler view, or um, multiple passes through the view layout were replaced by constant layout. But those are mostly for efficiency of the UI. And in the sake of architecture, let's say the other layers, uh, business logic, data retrieval, so on, there was nothing. So around 2015, I remember there was like a big push for something of a framework that could clean this up. Uh, I remember the framework Mosby, which tried to do uh, was named after the character from the popular TV show How I Met Your Mother, uh, and it sort of tried to push the MVP uh, architecture uh, as the winner of uh, choice. Um, didn't really make that much of a splash, you know. Never really got that popular. Um, on on the opposite side of the aisle, uh, in the uh, iPhone development, MVC was pretty much in force and heavily supported. But uh, none of these were kind of the winner because the three letters or four letters in case of MEV and architectures, they all tend to suffer from the same problem, which is, okay, model, that's easy. That's just my business logic and my data structures or data classes, whatever. View is obvious. That's what displays the logic. So everything else goes into controller, presenter, or view model. This is another thing that I also went through. Uh, but around mid-2017, Goku introduced the architecture components. Uh, which was great. Um, some of the developers really jumped on it as soon as it was public, uh, public beta. So it introduced uh, view models, which were really cool, even though they break some of the principles mentioned in the book. Um, but uh, it also introduced observable live data, and if you combine it with other, um, other stuff, such as the data binding library, or later the view binding library, uh, you could very easily observe the data, so it should uh, solve our lives forever, right? Well, not quite, because like I mentioned, the obvious choice is like, okay, if it's not a view and it's not a model, it's a view model and this is where I dump all of my logic, which kind of breaks the testability requirements of the clean architecture. So here's a little redrawn picture. As you can see, there's one circle uh, of protection missing in this. And that was the enterprise logic that doesn't really have that much of a use case in the Android world. So it's just dropped from this picture. I, I use it from a book by Aaron Buchner. And it sort of like um, describes it. You, you don't think of it as layers. It's more of like circles of protection. So use cases and domain models are protected from changes in view models, presenters, repositories. And these three are, are protected from changes in, let's say, activities, fragments, uh, network handling, sensors, and so on and so forth. All right, so I'm going to talk about the layers that uh, are often described. Clean architecture doesn't really prescribe the number of layers or, or, or what you should call them. 
but usually uh, they are the following. Domain layer, as you can see, there's a little Kotlin sign, should be purely Kotlin, right? This is where your policy or your behavior lies. Uh, oftentimes, uh, there are classes called use cases. They are roughly uh, equivalent to use cases from UML they are, or from the software that Rational was developing pre-UML. So use case is a single um, business case that does a sim single thing. It should be very easily testable. It should be very easily uh, um, developable uh, using just your, your pure language or maybe some uh, first party thought of libraries such as flows, coroutines, and so on. Uh, there are multiple ways how to implement them. For example, Aaron Buchna has uh, complicated structures using base use case that uh, gets its own coroutine context, and then you launch the use cases using something called uh, um, use case executor. In Kiwi, we opted for something like far, far simpler. There are essentially SAM single access method functors if you know functors from C++. So it's a simple class. It only has one operator invoke, and then it returns uh, either flow or it suspends directly, so it's up to the caller to, uh, to handle the, uh, the threading. Um, and use cases are, are talking to something called repository, repository user sort of entrance gate towards uh, uh, data retrieval. Uh, the data from the use cases are mapped to domain models, which is then handled by the presentation layer. All right, presentation layer, once again, this is kind of getting boring, uh, pure Kotlin. Okay, why? The goal of the presentation layer is to crunch the data to make it as simple as possible for the UI to display. So UI should be very lazy. It shouldn't do anything regarding uh, data changes or, or, or switching the data structure around, All right? There's a little tricky part. I am good on time, so I can mention it. Um, for example, let's say that you get your data and you have, you have a, two possible values, so you can represent it as a Boolean. In case A, you display this string. In case B, you display that string. You might be tempted to sort of like put the resource in there. No, it doesn't belong there. Uh, we're still not getting to the Android stuff. Um, Another thing, although this is a little discouraged, so this represents my opinion and not the opinions of, of the authors of these books I'm going to present at the end of the presentation. Sometimes if the, if the domain data is so simple, like for example, in the Kiwi app, if you go to the last step before your, before your checkout, we're offering a third party service called AirHelp Plus, and our data structure is just the price and a Boolean that says whether the offer is available or not. So, uh, you know, there are, there are cases, there, there are arguments to create a mapper that would map the domain layer into something more presentable, probably dropping the irrelevant is available attribute. Uh, if the data is like very simply structured, despite Uncle Bob's uh, strict warning that skipping a layer might prove uh, to be more painful as time comes, uh, we still do it and we're just fine. So uh, use it at your risk. All right, so this is, um, this is a little diagram of how the presentation layer works. So it uh, essentially gets the domain layer data, then it uses some mapper, then it dumps the presentation data. Uh, we use it in more complicated cases, like for example, in our seat map, like we have the very, very uh, um, detailed data about seats for a particular flight. And then we have like a little header that says, okay, the seats are from range, let's say 10 euros to 20 euros. So in that case, I actually do employ a presentation logic. And because I want to be sure that it's, that it's uh, done well, there's a comprehensive set of uh, unit tests that I'm currently writing, for example. And then uh, I, I can be 100% sure that my presentation logic is good and the UI uh, gets the uh, properly formatted data. All right, DUI layer. Finally, there's, there's some Android. Uh, so this is, where, this is where the stuff that we're used to lives. Your context handlers, your resources, your assets, your composes. Uh, everybody knows this stuff. It's a little boring. Um, currently, there are, there are more ways how to do UI. Um, you can do the old uh, uh, view framework or view toolkit or whatever. It doesn't really have a name. We can do compose, which is way more exciting. You should all do compose, little toot. Um, or you know, if you're crazy, you can you can do something else like uh, draw on a canvas if if you feel like. Uh, so that this is where your this is where your UI logic. So so far, if you remember the if you remember the rings from the original picture, 
uh, we were going upwards, now we're going to go downwards to the data layer and the data and the data source layer. All right, data source, Android as well, which might be a little confusing, but um, if you really think about it, data sources can be multiple things. They could be your databases, which are usually tied to the built-in SQ, SQLI database. Uh, they could be network data, database, uh, sorry, net, they could be network data sources, uh, where you retrieve probably some serialized data from the internet, uh, JSONs, your protobufs, whatever. Or it could be something uh, more Android tied to, such as share preferences. That's a, another example of data source. Or one of the cool arguments that Aaron Buchner had was that, uh, uh, for example, permission handling can be a data source as well. So if you want to read whether you have a permission, that should be treated as a data source, for example, which is an innovative way of thinking about it. And then there's the data layer. Um, sometimes these two are packed together in, in some diagrams uh, from, from some authors. Sometimes they are distinct. Uh, um, sort of, this is once again your plain Kotlin humble objects. Uh, they don't really do that much and just, uh, you know, at times, for example, in case of databases or in case of uh, JSON uh, deserialization, there might be some annotations that are tied to, uh, might be tied to the data layer. And so a mapper, once again, would map these decorated classes into something that's actually usable in the domain layer. So here's a little bit of um, overview. So one of the questions that you might have is like, okay, I talked about clean architecture, I talked about what Google did. So does it mean that now that I have my uh, fancy uh, Jetpack architecture view models, I have to dump them and I have to write everything in Kotlin? No, uh, they don't really go against each other. You can use clean architecture with what we have, which is probably the um, most common case is, is the Jetpack architecture view models. Um, you just treat the view model as a sort of interface layer uh, between your use cases and between your views. And then if the logic is uh, complicated enough, then we use a little presentation uh, mapper as well. All right, um, before I go to the sources, there is one uh, sub-chapter I would really like to mention, which is, uh, okay, what about, uh, what about DI, right? Because if you're using HILT, which is a very popular uh, dependency injection framework, it uses annotations. So everything that you have, every view model or every interdependencies on the component is annotated. Uh, and um, so that would pollute the architecture, right? And it's kind of like to quote Anchorman, 60% of the time works all the time. Uh, so Uncle Bob deals with it in, in following fashion. Um, you can still have clean quote unquote architecture even if, even if the framework, but it should be an informed choice, right? Because how we describe it is sort of like marriage. If you decide to marry a certain framework, you probably have to support it for the rest of your application lifecycle, or you have to remove it at a severe pain at some point. And if you want to have a conversation topic with Rach, uh, uh, <laughs> with a beer, ask him about how well it went when he was uh, removing mock Etel and replacing it with mock K and how much fun did he have. So um, it's okay to sort of like rely on, on a framework for something as crucial as dependency injection because the value is tremendous and the clean architecture should be a servant and not your master, uh, but it should be an informed choice. Uh, and once you do the choice, you're probably stuck with your dependency injection framework forever. So I don't think we're ever getting rid of coin because uh, we would have to shut down the engineering for about a year, I guess. All right. Um, what did I uh, take inspiration from? Uh, there's this OG book, Clean Architecture, by Robert C. Martin. Um, it's in the Robert C. Martin series, but it's got way worse reviews than uh, Clean Code and Clean Coder, which were the preceding books in the series. Um, I liked it. It's about 400 pages, uh, but it doesn't really speak about clean architecture that much. If you, if you, you know, you might be surprised by that. It's sort of like. Let's say a third of the book is, is the actual concept of the clean architecture and then its story is like, I used to work for a telephone company in the 70s and uh, I wrote some terrible code. So if you're not into that, uh, probably you could pick up one of the others. Uh, there's this one by an English author called uh, Aaron Bujna, uh, released this year by PBB Publications. And um, this one is an interesting one, which is usually what people say when something is not that great. Um, the architecture that he proposes in the book is very clean, 
But if you know who preppers are, you know, those kind of people who have the fallout shelters and are stocking ammunition, medicine, clean water, and, and canned foods and preparing that something might come, zombies, nuclear holocaust, something like that, uh, this app will survive everything, right? If Google decides to uh, chuck uh, architecture components tomorrow, uh, this app survives. Uh, if, if something uh, changes and Compose is no longer the new cool thing, this app survives. But I would definitely not like to work on a project that's written in this. And it's sort of like, I, I think that the reason for writing this book is sort of like, I had to explain my junior devs why they have to use this horrible thing um, because it's very, very clean. So read it at your risk, uh, but it had cool pictures, so I stole them for this presentation. Um, so these drawings are not mine. Uh, and the third one is the clean Android architecture. So not to be confused for, with clean architecture for Android um, by Romanian author Alexander Dumbravan. Um, it's, um, it's great, it's just not for me. It's sort of, if you, have a, if you have a junior developer who knows Kotlin, is excited about writing apps, is like, you know, at the beginning of the programming journey, it's not bad, but he's kind of confused, like, sorry, he or she is kind of confused. Uh, you know, why should I put this in a repository? Why should I put this in a use case? What's this, what's that? It's a great source of inspiration. It sort of goes like throughout the, throughout the journey of like where we had the God objects and then we had the view models and now we're writing this because uh, it's way more maintainable. Um, so if you have a person like that in your team, this is a great recommendation. All right, uh, that's kind of it. That's me, that's my phone number. Uh, <laughs> that's my email address in case, I'm not very much present on socials, but uh, Kachka told us that we are supposed to promote ourselves, so uh, write me an email and uh, Twitter, and that's the kiwi.com website because it was in the template. Uh, thank you. So, Mario, you have two questions. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. Do you want the funny one or the normal Let's one? Let's start with the funny one. Okay. Where is my Java man? Where is my Java man? Yes, this question. Uh, you can see here. Okay, so that's this from, guy, from this guy. No. Uh, no? Where is my Java man? I don't know. Um, I don't really have answer to that, but uh, there, there used to be this meme of like really, really strong weightlifting guy. And well, not really, it was like a little out of shape, but when I really wanted to insult somebody who was working with me, uh, there was like a little meme on writing on it, bro, do you even Java as a, as a play on bro, do you even lift? So I guess that guy, Okay. <laughs> if that counts as an answer. I don't know. <laughs> sure, all right, read another one. Okay, second question. Do you really have time to ma maintain clean architecture? That good question. Well, to quote a great colleague of mine, uh, there is an inherent advantage of this, which is you don't really have to think about how to structure a code anymore, so it kind of clears your head. And once it clears your head, you have a time for actually doing other st stuff, such as maintaining your code. So. Once everything is a use case, or once everything is a repository, or it's a data source, or it fits one of these boxes, and it usually should. Uh, there are few exceptions, like with everything. But once you have that, it's like, it's kind of okay. And it's like, what is actually a maintenance? Maintenance is a change. Somebody wants to change something, right? So the, the, the entire goal of clean architecture is to make you more flexible to changes, because you just swap one use for another. Right? If your UI changes, you don't, have to change your, you don't have to change your business logic. If your uh, presentation layer changes, the so UI is okay because the presentation logic has changed. Right? Suddenly we don't use ranges, for example, in Seatmap and we decide to say, okay, uh, just you know, f free buy it, YOLO, something like that. So I would say yes, it's actually way more maintainable rather than, um, let's say, running around like headless chicken and trying to fix everything that changed all the time. Yeah, we have another two questions. Okay. I am not sure what does this mean, but uh, do you follow DDD? What is DDD? Domain-driven design. Domain -driven design. Uh, I've heard of it once as a, as, a, as a topic, but I never went to the talk, so uh, I don't think so. All right. I'll take it as a, as a study material for next time. Sorry, or we can talk about it, um, you know. So question is, uh, answer is no. 
You don't follow it. Maybe we do. Well, I don't you know. Don't know about it. Okay. <laughs> and the last question: Is your architecture vertically scaled or horizontally? Well, it's kind of both, right? Because the horizontal scaling is like you divide the apps into very, very um, huge plethora of t really tiny modules. So each feature has its own module. So if you really look at how the dependency graph would look like, on the top you have the dirty app module, right? And that depends on everything. But then you have the domains, right? So for example, when we have cases for search and filters and everything, this is the horizontal scaling. But the feature then again is divided into um, multiple components, in our case in ancillaries, right? So we have APIs that we expose to other of our consumers. We have the implementations that uh, hide the policy or the business. We don't need that anymore. Um, and um, also the UI. So it's sort of, I would say that the main scalability is in the horizontal direction. Right? Okay. And uh, we have another new question. Mm -hmm. What resource can you recommend to get into clean architecture? Seems to me those books are not the best start from what you said. So maybe some YouTube channel or something? I mean, you already started, you came here. So he said humbly. Now, um, the, the thing is, um, there's a, it's, a, it's a cool concept, but it's not worth a book, right? So, um, but the thing is, um, you have some, somebody like Addison Wesley Pearson and they printed two books and they sold really well. So what they asked for is a third book. So, okay, okay uh, I think uh, Uncle Bob said, all right, I'll write another one. So he wrote the chapters about clean architecture and it was more of a pamphlet, right? Because it originated as a blog post. So uh, Addison Wesley said, no, we don't want that. We want the book. So he added like a bunch of unrelated stuff, some chapters by host co-authors. Co and um, it's not really as coherent as clean code and clean coder. So, the, um, the original blog posts are still up there on the Uncle Bob's blog. I guess you could look it up if you look for Robert C. Martin blog, it's there. It's from 2011 and it's the, the main post is called The Clean Architecture. That's where the picture that always comes up in Google, the one with the four circles comes up. Read that, that's pretty good. And then there's a lot of, I don't want to say parasites, but people who try to like evangelize this for you. So there are like clean architecture for, for PHP, which is um, clean architecture for Android, clean architecture for iOS, clean architecture for this and that, clean architecture in Ruby. And it's kind of like, well, it's kind of weird for, a, for overall concept that should uh, cover everything from embedded devices to web applications to Android to uh, backends and stuff. There are some video curses, but they kind of suffer from the same thing. So I think um, get hired by a great company. You can, you can learn the most from your for example, colleagues. Kiwi, right? For example, Kiwi, uh, <laughs> if we were hiring. <laughs> um, um, and I guess talk to your devs if you don't want to read books that have a lot of clutter in it. Uh, it's like, it's not that this one is bad, it's just, it's, it's too much, I would say. Uh, you could try it and maybe you'll have better experience with it. Maybe you can skip some chapters. Yeah, that's true. Uh, this one is PackPup and PackPup is like hell bent on dumping as much code in, onto the pages because it increases the page count. So once again, um, mm, there's like no condensed, um, no condensed source for this, I would say. Even the video tutorials are kind of like, it's not a concept that requires 13 hours of uh, explanation, but that's what Udemy wants. They want th 13 hour course, otherwise it won't get uh, submitted. Okay, that's all. Oh, one Use <laughs> cases in Under Studio uh, with, the, with this single invoke function. Mm -hmm. did, did you find a way how to navigate to the source code if you use it in Fimodal because I'm so much annoyed if I you mean the parentheses? You can click the parentheses. I can click the parentheses and it will take me to the use case file, right? Yeah. Oh, great, thank you. But there's a new Maybe thing. You can uh, repeat the question. Yeah, sorry, just Video. for the recording, like how to, how to quickly jump to the use case from, let's say, the usage. And you can just hold uh, 
Control on Windows or Linux and Command on uh, Apple devices. And uh, that, would, that would take you to the source file. There's a, there's a new thing. You won't have this problem if you have properly set lint because there's a new um, uh, lint from uh, Slack, right? I think it's Slack. No, it's ours. Okay. Uh, but there's a new lint rule for invoke, right? You have to use invoke. Is, or is, it, is it purely ours? I think so. I think it's external. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, one way how we can definitely avoid this if you manually type dot invoke. And then you can tap the invoke. All right. Yeah, that's all. Are we done? Oh, no, no? no, sure. So where do repositories from the official Android architecture fit in the in, uh, in the Linux architecture? There are repositories in in architecture components. I don't think so. So it is just some best best practice, maybe. Yeah. So repository is is basically. Um, a gateway between um, your data source, whichever the data source is. So it can, it can, you know, use case can, can use multiple data sources to, to like tie them together. That could be the case, but you know, I guess the proper answer is it depends <laughs> based on what you need.